Hello, my name is Daniel Powell. I'm a 20-year veteran of the medical device industry and have worked at several large medical device companies, such as St. Jude Medical, which is now part of Abbott, and Cyberonics, which is now part of Levanova. I have a business degree from Texas A&M and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spark Biomedical, the developer of the Sparrow Therapy System, an FDA-approved wearable neurostimulator for opioid withdrawal and addiction recovery. While there is no way for me to convey everything you would need to know in under 30 minutes, my main objective is to bring awareness to various key parts of being an entrepreneur and giving you a framework to understand the scope of starting a company in the neurotech space. We will go over identifying the market need for an innovation, how to finance your endeavor, the people you'll need in this journey, the various legal aspects of starting a company, and finally, an overview of what the business life cycle will look like as you go from conception to commercialization. Understanding how to analyze and determine the market needs is a core activity for any type of innovation. Too often, an inventor creates something they think is amazing only to find out after investing their time and money that the market doesn't actually want their invention. There are several methodologies for this process, such as the Stanford Biodesign Innovation Process, that outline proven ways to elicit unmet needs from your key stakeholders. And thus, the identification of who the key stakeholders are is just as critical. You need to look beyond physicians and patients and see the whole ecosystem from the clinic or hospital in which the care may be administered to, how it impacts the payers, and even consider how it impacts admission, back office, or any number of the other ripple effects from changing the status quo. Lastly, you want to know the market size. You can perform the exercise of starting with a potential addressable market, what's the entire possibility, then narrowing it down by a more realistic total addressable market, then what can actually be serviceable, and finally what's actually obtainable. You don't want to spend all this time and money and realize there aren't enough procedures or patients to realistically, uh, avail that are realistically available to support the business. For my company, Spark Biomedical, we did this exercise, starting with understanding that there are more than 100 million individuals in the world abusing opioids, but focusing on the U.S., our total market would be approximately 15 million Americans that suffer from some degree of opioid use disorder and about 10,000 treatment facilities. From there, we recognized the serviceable market was probably one-third of those numbers, so 5 million Americans across 3,000 facilities. But the truly serviceable market size, given our, how spread out the population is, and the number of individuals in unreachable rural communities, cut that down to about 1,000 facilities and 2.5 million individuals annually. We determined this is more than sufficient to build a healthy business upon. Some businesses end up with around 40 to 50,000 patients potentially a year and can still build a profitable business. That's just the analysis you will need to perform. In the end, to be successful, you have to find what the market wants, not what you want. Don't try to prove your idea will work. Try to prove it won't. To innovate takes money, and a lot of new entrepreneurs think this will be their toughest hurdle, but it really isn't. It's not as difficult as you may think. There are plenty of investors in this space looking for new innovations and ideas. Typically, they want to know much, uh, how much money do you need and what is it for? How long until they get their return on investment is an often asked question. Th these are all very difficult questions in the beginning. The key is to manage your fundraising carefully. Every company is going to be different, but I'll walk through one typical way this may play out. First, you have an idea and submit a grant to test your hypothesis. Grants are great because they are non-dilutive. A small business grant could award between $100,000 and $200,000. Other grants could be more or less than that. A phase two small business grant could get you up to $2.5 million, but probably wouldn't be your first step. You could skip the grant route, or in addition to it, raise between a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, via friends and family round. This is normally just common stock and comes from exactly who it says, friends and family. These rounds tend to be focused on building an early 
prototype or proof of concept that will give enough confidence to really make sure the idea is worth pursuing. For my company, we raised about $400,000 from friends and family and used it to file patents, build a prototype, and do a small five-patient proof of concept study. We started off just raising $250,000 but had so many people wanting to invest, we just kept taking the money. My CFO always told me, take more than you think you'll need, and he's been right every time. And speaking of CFOs, having a financial advisor in the early days looking out for your best interest is invaluable. The next round of money is typically called your seed round. You could have one or two of these rounds, and they are often attracting angel investors or individuals that specialize in investing in early stage companies on their own behalf. These rounds will most likely be preferred stock rounds, and there's not enough time, but you will want to research preferred stock and all the potential rights that the stock may have over common stock. There are plenty of YouTube videos on the subject. Once you are needing more than, let's say, $5 million, you would want to move to a Series A round. To raise these larger amounts, you'll most likely be talking to either venture capitalists or private equity groups. These groups have specific funds for investments with specific return criteria. When you're raising money, you're selling off your company. For every fund round, funding round, you will need to determine the pre and post money valuation of the company as this determines how much you are diluted. Too many founders have been excited by what they thought was a really big check only to have sold off so much of their company they get very little return upon exit. However, you don't want to chase a higher valuation and lose by giving away too many rights on the preferred stock. As mentioned before, there are many variables and too many to explain here. Just make sure to educate yourself on the subject. It's not overly complicated, you just need to be aware. And lastly, one major question every investor will ask is what's your exit strategy? You'll need to think long and hard about this. Do you want to take this all the way to the market and sell the product? Or do you just want to sell the technology to a bigger company after a proof of concept that is proven feasible? Knowing your exit strategy will drive how much money you raise and how you spend it. At the end of the day, the people in your organization are critical to determining the success or failure. So having the right talent that aligns with the company, culture, and vision is key. In addition, payroll is one of the most expensive line items every month. So you need to have the right people at the right time. We won't go into all the various roles, but I think it's prudent to clarify the role of CEO. Whether you are CEO, or a point one, it's critical that the three main activities are fulfilled. First, the CEO is responsible for setting the vision. Some have even called this role a chief vision officer. Second, the CEO is responsible for onboarding and managing the people with the talents and skills to execute the vision. And third, the CEO is responsible to make sure there's money in the bank. If the CEO ignores any one of these core functions, the organization will drift off course and constantly be struggling. If managing these three critical functions is not something you're going to honestly be successful at, consider being the chief technology officer or chief science officer or some similar role and hire a CEO. Earlier I mentioned onboarding key talent at the right time. This will be driven by the needs of the business. To do this, Know when to use consultants, part-time, or fully outsourced services versus full employed internal employees. And when you're onboarding new talent, be realistic about the delays in the business and don't hire too soon. Lastly, prioritize core competencies in-house where, uh, where knowledge won't be lost. In my organization, we have a handful of engineers that drive our core design and IP but outsource the rest of the development and testing. Once product development was complete and we were waiting for FDA approval, we only had two salaries to carry, not 10. Within MedTech, there are a couple of key roles to make sure to consider. Product development has to be done under a quality management system per FDA guidelines, and therefore having a quality manager early on in the design process is key. Also, Having engineers who know how to design FDA-compliant products is critical as well. 
Product design is only half the battle. The clinical evidence is the other half. Clinical study design is where most good products fail. So the clinical strategy needs to be developed carefully. Having your clinical strategy vetted by multiple experts is highly recommended. And lastly, you need a regulatory strategy that matches and supports both the product development and clinical strategy. Believe it or not, there are a lot of times and a lot of gray areas when it comes to submitting to the FDA, and you'll want an experienced person leading those negotiations. And lastly, to tie it all together, do not underestimate the need to lead and manage the team effectively. Management and leadership are skills that are needed to be developed. If you don't have much experience in this area, then treat it seriously and study it like any other skill needed for a job. Then wrap those skills and processes, define goals, and write your mission statement that you can lead by. Every step in the entrepreneur's journey interfaces with lawyers in some way. They can cost a lot of money, so the key is to be efficient, but not cheap. It will cost you far more to clean up a mess than to prevent it. And before you hire any old attorney, know they are not all the same. The same way all engineers don't know the same type of engineering, attorneys specialize. Some do real estate, others IP, and others business contracts. At Spark, we have a main attorney for contracts and investments, another for IP, another for trademark, and another for business liability. Let's go over a couple of key categories where you will need legal assistance. First, around corporate documents and entity formation. While you can easily enough form your own entity online, as soon as the fundraising begins, you will need a professional helping make sure all the corporate documents are up to speed. Forming a company itself isn't very expensive. You will just uh, need to determine what type, such as a C-Corp, S-Corp, or LLC. Investors tend to be most comfortable with a traditional Delaware, Delaware C-Corporation. The second area where attorneys are key is around any legal agreements, especially if it has any provision or touches intellectual property. If you are licensing technology or anything where if that agreement falls apart, your business is seriously impacted, then make sure you have your own lawyer review. The next major area is patents. Patents are the only thing keeping your idea from not being immediately stolen and knocked off. Every investor will want to know your patent status and having a good patent attorney is key. We don't have uh, the time to dig into patents in depth, but getting basic protection through a provisional patent costs as little as $500. And keep your ideas secret. Someone can hear you talk about the idea, then file a patent one day before you and they will have priority. Lastly, trademarks and copyrights need to be filed and often fought for if they are contested. Because there are, because there are limited names for products left that haven't been thought of and it takes some creativity to get your name protected. I made the foolish decision to name our product and start sharing that in the industry uh, presentations. Another company with a similar product in development literally took that name, trademarked it, and sent a cease and desist to me even though my product name predated their company's existence. They got the trademark and thus won. When you think about the full life cycle of your business, you can picture it in two major acts of a play. The first act is everything to design, develop, test, and get your product approved by the FDA. The second act is commercialization, the sales, marketing, and distribution of the product. And the first act, your first step will be most likely developing a proof of concept product and gain early evidence of success. This may include a preclinical or pilot clinical study as well. Along the way, you'll be developing your IP and getting funding. To enable success, you may join an incubator or find development partners. Overall, the purpose is to develop a go or no go decision. Once through the more exploratory stages, you move into true product development. Don't think of product development as engineering. It's much more the process of designing a product to meet the market needs. This process includes development under design controls, usability, iterative design, and all the testing and user validation work as well. If your product is novel and not a me too, 
you should consider building a minimally viable product, an MVP, meaning it's not gold-plated and doesn't have every bell and whistle, but it's just good enough to get to the market and start selling and do the job. Features and enhancements can come in future iterations. An adage I've heard many times in product development is better is the enemy of good. Now, if your product has a clear competitor, then a competitive feature set has to be considered. I won't go into here, but I recommend the Cano model as a methodology to guide this process. Also included in this work is the actual clinical research that proves the safety and efficacy of your product. As mentioned earlier, clinical study design is more, than, uh, more often the reason a product doesn't make it to market, uh, rather than engineering failures. All your development work should be done under a quality management system that is compliant with the regulatory bodies you intend to submit to, FDA for the US or a notified body for CE Mark in Europe. With a fully developed product, you have to also set up manufacturing. Hopefully, your product was designed with manufacturing in mind. It's one thing to build a single unit of a device. It's completely different to manufacture the same product thousands of times consistently always to specification and with reliability and defect free. Design for manufacturability is the term used to describe this process and it has very real impact on your business. If there are lots of manual steps, labor cost will drive up the price and could double, triple, or even quadruple your cost of goods sold. This is often overlooked in the initial design as you desperately try to get your product to market. That may be the right decision if those trade-offs are consciously made. Respecting how, a manufa how manufacturable a product is will save you a lot of headache and redesign when you're trying to scale the business. Also, for higher risk devices, the manufacturing process itself needs to be fully validated and submitted to the notified body. The last step is that regulatory submission. While the submission is the last item to getting the product to market, the strategy should have begun well before product development even started. Understanding your regulatory pathway drives the product development, the clinical design, and every aspect of development. And then, after you spend years developing and testing a product, hopefully you get that email that says your product has been approved to go to market. And suddenly, overnight, you have a brand new company. In my personal opinion, the really hard work begins here, commercialization. First, to sell the product, you will need to build up an entire infrastructure to manage inventory, warehouse product, and ship orders. Consider outsourcing uh, all this infrastructure if it does not need to be your core competency in the early days. Owning all the complexity and more importantly, the regulatory compliance of these processes may not actually add any value to the company in the early days. And lastly, sales and marketing. If you're a scientist, this may not be your area, uh, an area you're, you are most comfortable with in the business. However, having an appreciation for it is key. Don't assume it's easy or simple in any way. It is just as complicated as every other part of the business. Sales never just happen, especially in med tech. So having a commercial team with a solid go-to-market strategy is just as important as product development, clinical strategy, regulatory and operations. It's also important to understand the difference between sales and marketing. Marketing's job is a one-to-many relationship with the customer. Driving awareness, lowering the barriers for adoption, and creating an overall acceptance. Sales, the sales' relationship with the customer is more one-to-one, -one, and their job is to close deals. You can't put a pacemaker in an online shopping cart and just check out. You need somebody who closes those deals. Medical product tends to require a lot of on-site support and training, and sales agents tend to be very technical and proficient in the product, the disease state, and the physician's practice. Individuals that can sell, train, and support a surgical procedure are very expensive as well. If your product is new and disruptive, it may not have reimbursement established. Reimbursement is its own challenge and requires proof of market adoption and acceptance in addition to more clinical evidence than the regulatory bodies require even for just approval. 
With these factors, it is very possible for your commercial rollout to take equal or more funds than just getting the product to market. I hope you've enjoyed this very brief and quick overview of being an entrepreneur in the medical device industry, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you.